So last week we started this five-week series on redeeming your time. So let me give you a quick recap and remind you. Ephesians 5.17 says that we should walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Why? So that we will understand what the will of the Lord is. So now that we know God does care about how we manage our time and how we handle our time, how then should we redeem our time? Where do we look for an example? Well, like everything else in our lives, God gives us the perfect example of how to redeem our time by looking at the life of Jesus Christ. We talked about it last week, but some of you may still be asking, how can Jesus help me manage my time well? After all, he didn't have a smartphone. He didn't have emails pinging at him every 10 minutes. He said, Pastor, life was a whole lot different 2,000 years ago. Well, yeah, you'd be right. Jesus didn't have an Apple Watch. I love my Apple Watch. My Apple Watch even, oh, no, I wasn't talking to you. It loves me sometimes, too, because it keeps track of all my steps, and when I, when, I do, when I hit my goals, I get little fireworks and everything. It's so cool. But Jesus didn't have one of these. Jesus also didn't spend hours scrolling on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook. And I have to be really careful because if I start watching Southern Gospel Quartet music on YouTube, I'm, I'm lost, man. I'm dead. I'm going to be lost for the next two hours. He didn't have to choose between watching Netflix or Amazon Prime or HBO or any of that stuff and spending time in quiet solitude. He had time to do that. But Hebrews 4, 5 reminds us that we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. In the person of Jesus, Scripture tells us the Word became flesh. That meant he would be able to emphasize and, and, and identify with, empathize rather, with our weaknesses, including the problems we have in redeeming our time. We see all throughout the Gospels how Jesus' life was interrupted and how his attention was demanded. Remember the story of Jairus' daughter, Jairus, who was the, 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 uh, the very uh, excellent Roman authority that, that many of the Jews respected because of his respect of them, and his daughter was sick, and and Jairus had said, well, just say the word, Master, and my daughter will be well, and Jesus said, no, 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 I'm going to go to her house. And on the way to the house, some woman grabs the hem of his garment. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops and goes, uh, who touched me? I'm going over here. Why are you bothering me now? I got things to do. Why are you sending me this email? Maybe you remember the story. Jesus has gone to Peter's mother-in-law's house to teach and to preach. And in the middle of it, somebody cuts a hole in the roof and drops a sick man down through the roof because they can't get in through the crowd and they want Jesus to heal their friend. I don't know about you, but I have not been in many situations where people cut holes in the roof and drop people down. Just imagine what Jesus had to do after that. He had to go back to what he was teaching. I mean, that's really messing up your schedule. Now, granted, Jesus didn't have to manage time management issues like some of us do, but he did understand what it was to be distracted and to be deterring or, or something trying to deter him from what he was trying to do. And so last week, we looked at the first of seven principles for how Jesus managed his time. He started with the Word, prioritizing his time with the Father over everything else. This morning, we're going to look at two more principles. Here's the first of those two principles. To redeem our time in the model of our Redeemer, we must ensure that we let our yes be yes from the smallest to the biggest commitments that we have. Now, I'm going to define a new term for you that you may not know. That term is open loop. Oops, back up. Open loop. An open loop 
is a commitment that you have made to yourself or to somebody else, big or small, which goes unfulfilled. For example, you might be on a call with someone and say, hey, as soon as we get off the phone, I'll send you a link for that book or for that email, or you know, I'll send you a link for that web page. And you hang up, and all of a sudden something comes up, and guess what? You forget to send the link. You've made a commitment to yourself and to them, and if you don't do it, that's what we call an open loop. Now, we all have open loops and missed commitments. We tell a friend that we'll come to their event, and then when the event, the day of the event arrives, we forgot all about it, and we didn't go. Or you promised to do something at work, but something else came up at work, and you didn't get it done. In isolation, those things don't seem like a big deal. However, failing to do the things that you say you're going to do is a much bigger deal than simply letting something slip through the cracks. It's a matter of trust. And because it is a matter of trust, the stress that open loops create and cause should, and in my experience often do, affect Christ followers in significant and negative ways. Because Jesus said, we should let our yes be yes and our no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. In her, uh, in her book, In His Image, Jen Wilkins states it very eloquently. She says, do we Christians do what we say we do? Do we let our yes be yes and our no be no? Ultimately, every act of faithfulness toward others is an act of faithfulness toward God himself. Though others may make commitments they have little intention of keeping, the children of God strive to prove that their word is their bond. They do so not to win the trust or approval of others, but because they long to be like Jesus. They long to hear with their ears, well done, good and faithful servant. In addition to being a commander of Jesus, when we fail to keep our commitments or keep close those open loops, science says that we feel anxiety and stress. Now, I won't bore you with all of the science, but you know how I like this stuff. This is called the Zygernick effect. I'm going to give you the Zygernick effect in a really good example right now. Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark. Yeah, yeah. And now you're not going to get that song out of your head for the next 20 minutes, are you? You're not going to get it out until you go through mom, daddy, shark, do do, and baby, sh and you know you're going to do the whole family. I know. I understand how that works. That's the Zygernick effect. It creates an open loop in you that, that until you close it or somebody closes it for you by taking you in an entirely different direction, which I hope to do right now, it, it bugs you. And it bugs you. And when you think about the things that you have to do, they bug you because you internalize them. The Zygernick effect will cause your mind to keep replaying the same thing over and over and over again until something else happens. Now, granted, thinking about baby shark to do to do to isn't a big deal. I got that. But when we have internalized tasks and commitments that we have not followed through with, and our yes is not being our yes, it can be a very big problem and distraction. Okay, some of us know this feeling you've had a prescription waiting at the drugstore for four days now, and they keep calling you and sending you texts and sending you emails, and you keep forgetting to go by to get it. Again, not a huge deal, but every time you get that text, it's a reminder that there's something you're supposed to do that you didn't do that you have to do and that you should do, and so what you're doing now has to get put aside. That's why it's so great to not internalize all this stuff, but to externalize it to some better systematic thing that you can rely on. For example, a to-do list or a calendar reminder. Or if you're really geeky, some 
time management software thing that you can put on your computer. Stress comes when you have unkept arrangements with yourself. And the more of those things you have, the more stress and anxiety you will feel. So how do we handle that? What does the Bible have to say about that? Does the, the phrase open loop occur in the Bible? Well, not exactly. But Paul does address this connection. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In other words, he says, don't let these things stress you out. Turn them over to God. Now, I think that's just another external methodology like the to-do list. And there are some things we can turn over to God and say, when we surrender them to him, and say, God, I can't do anything more about this. I've done all I can do. I've done all I want to do with it. It's up to you now to handle it. And we say, I really understand. Wow, does that preach? Does that preach? Because maybe some of you don't understand. But isn't that right? Isn't that right? When we surrender those external concerns, those internal concerns to God and say, I can't do anything more about it then God will let us and help us focus on the things we can do something about. Okay, that's the, the, the second principle. The third principle is this. To redeem our time in the model of the Redeemer, we must dissent from the kingdom of noise and create room for stillness, silence, and reflection. One of my favorite books, and if you've never read this book, please Download a copy on Amazon or get a copy on Audible or go to the library. By C.S. Lewis, it's called The Screw Tape Letters. How many of you have read The, the Screw Tape Letters? They're, 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 it's, a, it's a work of fiction, obviously. But C.S. Lewis basically has uh, devised this system where uh, there's a senior demon named Wormwood who is writing to his nephew demon about the work that he is doing in the church and how to destroy the church. And there's a lot of truth in that book. And one of the things he talks about is this kingdom of noise. Wormwood ex explains that when hell triumphs, in his mind hell is going to triumph, when hell triumphs, the whole world will be a kingdom of noise because silence and worship are an anathema to Satan. And he wants noise, noise, and more noise. You know, we always talk about hell being a, a place of darkness and a place of fire. I think it's also going to be a place where the decibel level is going to be about 200, degree, uh, 200 dBLs. It's going to be loud. So loud we won't be able to stand it. Now, let's be honest. We live in a time of unprecedented noise. And I'm, just, I'm not just talking about the the, uh, the increase of noise in construction and uh, some people's lack of understanding what mufflers are intended to do on cars. I'm talking about the noise that comes from nonstop news, nonstop entertainment, the devices that buzz in our pockets and our purses or that talk to us when we're trying to preach. But there is something of an internal noise that takes place. If you've ever tried to sit down and pray or just sit still for a minute and have your mind just going in a thousand miles an hour, you understand what that internal noise is. There are nights when I try to go to sleep and my brain just will not shut off thinking about what I've got to do or what I've got to say or where I've got to be. 
or, you know, 6 o'clock is going to come awfully early. I shouldn't have stayed up and watched the end of that movie and not come to bed till 12. Amen. So how does all that noise relate to our issues with time management? Simple. It keeps us from doing what we ought to do, and that is to worship, be quiet, and meditate on God's Word. Therefore, we have to learn how to dissent from this kingdom of noise. And, and it, it, it limits our abilities in these ways. It limits our ability to think. When our minds are filled with noise, there is just no mental space to think. And if we can't think clearly, we cannot prioritize those to-do lists that we're trying to write out. And if we can't prioritize the to-do list, it means we can't effectively engage with the work that God has given us to do. Because good work requires great thought, and great thought requires greater solitude. One of the things that we always encourage pastors to do when they come into the board of ministry meeting is we tell them, you need to find time away from everything. You're not studying your Bible, you're not talking to your family, you're not dealing with church. You need to find time to get away from everything so that you can just shut your mind down and let God fill it. Secondly, it limits our ability to create. Creativity comes from contemplative moments. Most of the time, they say, they say um, uh, a necessity is the mother of invention. Sometimes contemplation is the mother of creativity. If you just stop and quiet your mind, and shut down the, inter the internal noise, the solution might show up. If we don't have the space to work out our God-given gifts of creativity, to think outside the box about how to do certain things, to find new solutions to old problems, it will be very, very difficult to be productive in doing kingdom work. Because remember what they always say. If you keep doing the same thing the same way, you're going to keep getting the same results. That's the definition of insanity. Doing it the same way and expecting different results. So noise limits our ability to be creative. Noise also limits our ability to go deep. By this I mean to, to cultivate a depth of thought. God did not design our mind simply to receive information. I don't preach every Sunday morning just so that somebody will come up and say, oh, that was a good sermon, Pastor. I preach because I want you to hear what I say and think about it. What does that mean to me in my life? What should I be looking at and evaluating in my actions? God created us to think about and make creative connections between various input. Here's the thing that, that you will all readily identify with this. You might be in a conversation with your spouse or your family members or somebody at work, and all of a sudden your mind is 10,000 miles away, and you're not even really listening to what they say. That can be really bad, especially if all of a sudden in the middle of that, they start pouring out their heart to you and you're not paying attention. Oh, Jesus. Taking time to think deeply means that when we are with our family, we're listening to what our family says. When we are with someone that's hurting, we're listening to what someone's saying about their hurt. We're not, you know, because we've externalized all of the important stuff that we've got to do. We've surrendered stuff to God, and we can focus on the moment that we are there and go deep in thought with them and with ourselves. 
when we want to really be alone with God, we need to be alone with God. Number four, noise limits our ability to be at peace. Let me go back for just a minute to the verse that I just quoted from, or that we just read from Philippians. We read the part that says, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We understand that. Present our petitions to, to Christ, to God, and peace will come from that. But then Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. See, Paul is saying we shouldn't be anxious, anxious, shouldn't be worried. We should present our problems to God in prayer. He says then we'll have peace. And a lot of people just stop right there and say, oh, pastor, that's good news. I will surrender to God. I will get peace. I will have a wonderful time and a wonderful life. But Paul is basically using a principle here that we all know. Nature abhors a vacuum. If you empty out your mind completely, the enemy is going to find ways to put other stuff in it. So Paul says, don't just... Get rid of some things. Change what it is that you're using as an input. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. God blessed. Why does Paul make that list? Might it be because part of the solution to our anxiety is found in what we're choosing to think about? The information we ought to be inviting into our minds? Most noise is not true, noble, right, pure, lovely, or admirable. Most noise is just noise. Lastly, but most importantly, noise limits our ability to listen to God's voice. I wrote here, when I did the outline, and I got thinking about it because I read something. John Mark Comer, in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, says this, the noise of the modern world makes us deaf to the voice of God, drowning out the one input we most need. Man, that one stings. And make no mistake about it, noise is an intentional part of the enemy's plan to keep us from redeeming our time, to keep us from from hearing God's voice. The problem is less about what noise we, we, we allow into our minds and more about what noise it is the enemy wants to keep out of our minds. I think it's important to note the difference between hearing and listening. When we're reading God's word, we hear his voice. That's his voice speaking to us. But here's the thing, that quiet time that we call it when we're reading God's Word and, and praying, that's when our mind's going 100 miles an hour. We hear Him, but we're not listening to Him. So often our prayer time is consumed with, Father, bless this person, heal this person, provide the needs for this person, save this person. All very valid prayer requests. All very valid things to offer to God the Father. But sometimes God doesn't want to hear us. He wants us to listen to Him. And it's hard to do that. Because the enemy wants to fill our brains with noise. The most difficult thing there is to do is to not think about anything for a whole minute and just say, God, speak. Silence, stillness, solitude, reflection. That's the difference between hearing God's word 
and listening to his voice. Okay, so we all agree that too much noise is bad for us, right? So what do we do? Well, again, we look to our example of Jesus. The number of times that the Gospels mention Jesus' withdrawal to a solitary place is staggering. In the third Gospel, in, in, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, uh, or Luke mentions, rather, Jesus' love of lonely places three times in a chapter and a half, in about 40 verses. My favorite, probably, is the time, I didn't know if I put this up there or not, where Jesus withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. In other words, he had all these crowds following him, all these things he wanted to do, and the only way he could get away from them was to jump in a boat and go out in the middle of the lake. How many times have you decided the only thing I can do is jump in the boat and get out in the middle of the lake? You fishermen, I understand. That's, that's how you solitude. Yeah. But silence was so important to Jesus that he would literally do that just to get away from all the noise. He wanted to pray, think. He wanted to listen to the Father. And by the way, the busier he got, the more it appears that he sought out that silence. In fact, Luke 5, 15 talks about how the news about Jesus spread all the more and the crowds were all the bigger and everything else. And the bigger the crowds got, the more his notoriety got, the more often Jesus said, I got to get away. I got to get away to silence. I can't listen to all of this. I have to listen to him. So here are the three principles that we have learned thus far in two weeks. Start with the word, let your yes be yes, and dissent against the kingdom of noise. I think we've only scratched the surface of how Jesus redeemed his time, and I hope that what we've done so far leaves you feeling empowered, not discouraged. My point is not to discourage you. My point is not to condemn you. My point is to say, Look at what you're doing and how it's, how, it's, how it's going in your life and see if any of this stuff will help you do it better. And remember what we learned last week. Jesus gives us peace before we even start to do anything. He will speak peace to us. We don't have to do any of these things to be loved by God. We do them as a response to the love that God gives us because we want to redeem the time. We want to find the will of the Father and to do God's will. It's because of that love we want to do that. It's because we want to do the will of God and do it effectively that we incorporate these things.